Welcome back to the Tell Me About Midlands 103 podcast. I'm Sarah Cassidy and this is the podcast where you get to find out all about the inner workings of the radio station and who some of the people are behind the voices and who are in the background. Today it's all about Midlands Today and news. We have four guests with us. We have Midlands 103's MD and the presenter of Midlands Today, Will Faulkner, Head of News, Sinead Hubble, News Journalist, Cameron Clark and Researcher, Chloe Farrell. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Brilliant start. Um, Now, I think it's only best and right to start this whole conversation off with the mastermind and main driving force behind Midlands today. The head of news. (laughs) (laughs) No, no. The head of news, Shane Hubble. We'll go straight in with a question. What do you think is the hardest thing about putting together an award winning show is? It's finding the guests and content for it every single day. So we have three hours every every day, Monday to Friday, to fill and to find the voices and the issues that are really concerning people within the region. That's what we strive for every day. And this can be difficult days, and especially if guests can only do a certain time and they're not available later in the morning or they want to do next Tuesday instead of t- tomorrow <laughs> and things like that. So there is a lot of prep and stress and uh, hardship that goes into it and sweat and tears and all that as well. Oh, I thought it might have been getting the presenter in on time. but Well, I've given up hope on that. Yeah. All these years, I've even had to collect him at one stage mm-hmm. to make sure he got into that the studio. Was one time, 16 years ago, and still haven't left me. No, and I won't. So, um, Will, then, seeming that you are the main voice of the uh, Midlands Today show, can you tell us a little bit about your background and how you came into becoming the presenter on Midlands Today? So, I was in college and had no particular interest in radio and I uh, was on the college station enjoyed being on the college station and went to do a radio module in third year, produced a documentary as part of that module and again still not having any particular interest in radio thought eh, I'll send it into the local station and see what happens and sure enough they rang me and they said do you want a job? So I abandoned my dream of being a cameraman and suddenly at the deep end had to learn about news and didn't know my arse from my elbow when it came to news or one political party from another and very steep learning curve in CKR which was in Carlow and then that station lost its licence which had nothing to do with me (laughs) and that was a great opportunity, a blessing in disguise because I got to try different things so instead of just being a news journalist, I was landed with the talk show. I did some commercial production, jack of all trades, master of none. But it whet my appetite for talk radio. And I continued with it in KCLR, which was the station that took over, and eventually landed in Midlands in 2005 as the head of news. And uh, Fran Curry, in his wisdom, he was the program director and he can be heard on Tip FM. <coughs> uh, I don't know, we have great relations with Fran. Uh, Fran appointed me then to um, take over uh, what was a one o'clock, one hour show, one o'clock live. Wasn't that what we call it? The main point. Well, no, the main point. I did one o'clock live in KCLR. Different stations, it's all a blur and that's my age, confusing everything. So... Um, we did the main point for a year. Fran left and the Midlands Today slot became available. And because they could find nobody else, they turned to me. <laughs> and what's your favourite thing about presenting the show? The variety. And we're at it how long now? 17 years. So there haven't been two shows the same. And that's not to say there hasn't been a certain amount of rinse and repeat and you see some issues coming up all too often parents who have a sick child who can't access the rights, um, the services they're entitled to. You see some issues surfacing again and again, cost of living, shortage of housing. There's a certain powerlessness you're reporting it day in and day out. We don't do campaign journalism. You have to simply uh, hear different perspectives, give them equal hearing uh, and a fair platform. But sometimes there's a fatigue that sets in when, particularly during COVID, I'm sure you'll all remember hearing bad news again and again and again and again. So the 
benefit of the job is the variety and in contradiction the toil of the job is the sameness of it sometimes. So obviously you have to go through a lot of stories um, especially with Midlands today and also the news and it must take a long time to figure out what to put out there and what not to report on what to report on. Cameron as the journalist here what is it do you think uh, which stories like peak our uh, listeners ears the most? It's a question I ask myself every single day I'm in here because it's one that's probably impossible to answer because you just don't know. So typically what you aim for when you want to keep people interested is stories that they'll relate to, stories that affect them. So when the cost of housing goes up, people are automatically going to be tuned in, especially if they're looking to buy a home um, when it comes to, say, their local hospital is busy and they need to look at alternative options. But it, it can get to a situation where you can spend hours on a story and it go nowhere. I have an example of it. Um, there was a survey that came out a couple of months ago on the satisfaction of patients within the hospitals in the Midlands. I had spent probably far too much time on this story looking to go as in-depth as possible, you know, fleshed out on the website, made sure everybody had all the detail they could possibly have. The story went absolutely nowhere when it went up online. People just they weren't, weren't that interested and then... Only a couple of days later, I spent probably less than a minute on a pair of black swans that were in Shannon Harbour. A photo went up on Facebook. I'd say the story took me about 40 seconds and it was the most popular story we had that month. (laughs) It's incredible what people engage with and the stories that we cover and what actually really kind of hits home with people. I know like when Will first started, he was a very hard journalist came from that political side from the main point you know everything was very uh, political really wasn't interested in the human interest stories I came along loved all the human interest uh, stories the light fluffy bits and pieces and uh, slowly over time <laughs> um, he got into them as well so oh, part it, of it, it is that we've grown up with the show so we would have been early 20s when taking over mm. and had a certain life experience and then suddenly you draw down your own mortgage and all of those stories become Mm. more relevant and you then have, in my case, kids and they develop interests that broaden your own horizon. So, yeah, and and you're guided by research all the time as well. We have a target listener and then we'll have to see what that target listener is interested in and that's never static you know, new TV series come out or streaming series these days and if something is trending then we follow it and you have to have those differences in within the newsroom you're not looking for all the same people you're looking for people to challenge you to ask questions because you have to gauge what's happening you can't just go I like this this is what we're going to do and sometimes we argue over stories mm. that, that are going in and you know we can Sometimes I can convince them why I want to do something. Other times I can't. But I know when I'm passionate about something, I can convince him and make it happen. Yeah, and I'm disturbed sometimes to hear, like Cameron, and the effort you put into a story (laughs) and it doesn't connect. (laughs) But that's a serious problem for journalism and for democracy because we're not well funded. We rely on advertisers and commercial partners and if not for them there wouldn't be a radio station there wouldn't be an independent sector so in some ways we have to chase audience and those stories that require the more intense investigative work that's time consuming Mm, absolutely and it's resource intensive so you know if we were in RTE now there wouldn't be just four of us sitting on this side of the table there'd be a small army Mm, yeah you know, the main show from, what is it, 10 to 12 on their schedule probably has a crew of a dozen or more people mm. researching and um, you just can't find that in the independent sector. You what Will is trying it. to say is the, the four people sitting on the other side of the table from you, Sarah, are phenomenal at her. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it is true. And yeah. It was something, I suppose, when I started and you could hear, if you were listening to the likes of RT or anybody else and you hear the list of names that are read out at the end of the show and like for the longest time it was just myself and Will working on the show and Well me for half a day Yes 
and you for a full day because so, I have a management job as you mentioned at the outset so to try and make Sinead's life bearable Chloe and others before you have come in to mm. you know share that workload yeah it's it's a good though to just research all the different topics and I think the hardest part is kind of learning what suits and what's the kind of vibe that you're going for with it so getting along to that and figuring out what goes in where what will suit that's been interesting to see but your job's taking you a few places as well so as well as doing it for Midlands Today you also obviously for the the news team as well and it's taking you out to ploughing and the EP and and things like that and being able to talk to people um, and getting right in with the listeners at that event as well and talking to who we talk to straight to it what is the best thing about getting to talk to listeners directly it's really nice because i feel like people kind of confide in you so when people are listening to the radio they want to be getting accurate information so i feel like people feel like they can trust you so when you're chatting to them chances are they're going to keep you there for another 10 minutes telling you anything and it's just really nice to hear people's stories you could be asking them on one topic they'll go into something else and it's just it's really nice you you feel like you're making a friend nearly every time you're talking to somebody because one of the main ones that you do as an OB is um, and for Midlands today is the ploughing festival Mm. how many years have you done that now? Um, well, I remember 2007 was our first in Midlands, mm. our first. I'm sure the station previously was in Ballacolla and such places, but that was Anna Harvey just mm. outside Tullamore. We're the next uh, thigh, uh, I, think, I think, three years in a row. And then the big one uh, would have been Rathanesca, years one, two and three. Yeah. And Tullamore built on that for the next three years after that, until, of course, there was a storm (laughs) in 2018. It managed to disrupt the event in a way that never happened before. So normally it's Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Wednesday, this almighty storm blew in Mm. and they had to cancel the second day, rebuild and reopened on the third day and then had a historic fourth day which hadn't happened previously. So that was exciting in the wrong kind of way. Yeah, because the morning of the Wednesday, we didn't know whether we were broadcasting in studio or out uh, in in Mukla. Um, so we were half ready to go. We didn't know what uh, was We happened. had a contingency plan. So Albert Fitzgerald, my predecessor, God be good to him, he passed away last year, big uh, motorbike man. And he had a contingency to bring me or Carl or whoever would be next on air out on the back of the bike through all the traffic (laughs) into Mukla and yeah we've had a few hairy moments like that of technical problems behind the scenes that touch wood seldom Mm. make it onto the air we lost power at one stage just as we went on air one morning and there was a scramble to try and fix that guests not turning up when they were meant to like there's all sorts and especially when you're in a scenario like that where there's thousands of people around it can be very hard to fix those problems without seeing like be seen as a headless chicken running around the place <laughs> and, and scrambling so we normally would have our news team back at base and they're our anchor so if we can't get something out at the out at, at the plough and then it's their job to make sure that it seems seamless on air and uh, to help us along the way. So it, even though if you're not out at it, there's a huge role to, to play. But it mm. is very exciting few days. Lack now you sleep. present that as the ploughing just. I'm sure Chloe and Cameron can say how regular it is any given morning. <gasps> Somebody has to answer the phone. We need uh, five past ten. Mm. I'm sure it even happened today. Yes. Yeah. No, but I'm just saying in that scenario, there's always yeah. a team back here at base. But like that, yeah. What you'll normally hear is me filling relentlessly. Still to come today, A, B and C. And let me just expand on D a little bit. As he glares through the window at me wondering what's <laughs> happened, even though he has a thousand updates uh, on screen. So we've different Calling the next person We've next different first. hand signals, don't we? <laughs> we do have different. You know, so the, and, and the phone, the phone one, strange. you know, the phone one is, you know, he's coming, he's coming through. He's just not here yet. And then this one, which is like a <laughs> violin played awkwardly. Is I was going to say, this is a podcast, so you're going to have to... <laughs> <laughs> trying to describe yeah. 
<laughs> that's a sign that we need to take a song. Yeah. And this one means I'm number one. <laughs> and um, that's the middle finger. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it, it can be very tense at times, especially yeah. if, he, if he is uh, trying well, to fill it and wait, wait for a guest because even though it's only like could take 10 seconds for us to make a phone call waiting for that phone call to go through is the longest 10 seconds of his life and knowing whether we'll get a guest on and obviously we still have to do the pleasantries with the guest and make sure that we've double checked confirmed their name triple checked it and you see that glare going because he, he's running out of words to say <laughs> But it is a packed show every morning. That's the thing. There's there's so much in it and there's so much for a listener. So it must be sometimes quite hectic putting it all together. But is that part of why it's an enjoyable job, guys? Or I'd like them to add. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was looking over that side. <laughs> We're insulated from it. We've done it for it's so too long. Too long at this stage. No, I think it is. Like If it just worked smoothly and everything went to plan straight away, you'd probably get bored of it. You always want something a bit exciting to be happening and... The question, are they going to answer? Or if it's somebody that you haven't spoke to before, you're like, oh, I, I hope they're decent. <laughs> There's always the, the worry. Well, when I when I had started here, I started um, in work experience in college um, in my final year. And because COVID was still very much prevalent, the majority of my work on work experience was done outside the station remotely, where I'd go to interviews. I'd then send stuff into the station that I would have worked on from home my first shift in the station was covering Sinead as producer of the Midlands Today show on during the Christmas period when Will was also away and Claire O'Brien, one of our presenters here, was covering the show and it was by far the three most stressful days of my life. <laughs> now, add that in with Will. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he has given uh, people nosebleeds in the past from the stress of working with them. Um, Hang on. <laughs> Hang on. Because with podcasts, things are taken out of context quite a lot. <laughs> that is not true. You I are saying that in jest. That, that day. <laughs> But it wasn't because of working with me specifically. It was the experience of working on the show when things go wrong. Yeah. yeah. And that person is prone to nosebleeds. <laughs> and then you add into the mix when you have different presenters. Like, I know Will. I know what he's going to like majority of the time, what he's not going to li- like. And I know sometimes what he, he has little tricks as well. If I put in something that he doesn't like, <laughs> he keeps moving it to the end of the show and he goes, oh, I just ran over there. Oh, I took that song. I didn't mean to take that song. And then he'll go, oh, I don't have time to do them. You may get them as a pre-record. Um, so I know when he's pushing items and uh, when he really doesn't want to say no to me because I'm so excited about a certain piece that, that we have on. Um, but I think a common misconception is that we go on at nine o'clock with a full running order. <laughs> Seldom. Well, number one, I'm not here at nine o'clock anyway. Yeah. Here no, as my often night. extended nine o'clock news bulletins <laughs> would tell people, no, you are not here at nine o'clock. <laughs> to cover this off, I wake up and the first thing I do, grab, grab the phone, go through all the papers and you will get emails saying, I think this is a good article. We should develop this as a story, build on it. And maybe this one is just for mention. And then while I'm driving from Clumblogue to Tullamore, we have our phone call and map that out a bit more. And then I land in, usually while the sports news is on. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or sometimes just at the end of it. <laughs> So if you hear the job spot just before the Midlands Today show, it means I haven't made it in on time. <laughs> and I, I can I also didn't know tell that. whether he slept well that night or not because you notice if you, what time the emails come in at overnight as well. So if they're like two, three o'clock, you know you need to have coffee ready for him. <laughs> and it's going to be a long show. And if I am on my 15th news story, <laughs> yeah. that button, Will is probably not near the station. <laughs> But saying that as well, you do have another job here. So it's not all just Midlands Today for you. You are running the show as well. So, Well, I think everybody has that. So Sinead produces the show, but you're the news editor as well. Um, Cameron, you could be on the show recording an interview. You could be suggesting something to fill a blank slot you could be reading the news putting the news together and and very much the same for you Chloe and 
all around the building there are people who have to multitask. You're sitting here head of digital media and that's very much a commercial role, but you're here in a creative run uh, interviewing us for a podcast. So that's the nature of local radio. Back to what I said about RTE, you can get into a pigeonhole and have one specific role in a big organization. The beauty of a smaller group like this is you get to try lots of different things. You do, yeah, everything and anything. And that that's what local radio and why it's so lovely is you never know what you're going to do. Like you could be engineering an OB, you could be presenting a show, reading a news bulletin, you could be, I don't know, putting out fires <laughs> within the building but in yeah. some shape or form. And, and if you're the right sort of person, that's energising. Yeah. Not everybody has that agility or enjoys that agility and it can be very, very stressful. So let's be authentic about it and honest about it. Not everybody enjoys the experience and maybe for a while... You know, you had your three stressful days that Christmas. I hope it's less stressful now, but some people don't break through that barrier. They find, oh, this deadline, I need to find an item, there's a blank space, there'll be dead air. That's intolerable. And I think it's something particularly that should be taught in college when it comes to getting into a career like this is that there is, it is a stressful job. It's not something that, you know, you're going to come in every day is going to be happy and jolly and, you know, you're going to go home rested. You, There are going to be days when you're you're going to want to pull your hair out, like my first three days here. But it it is something when you stick, you stick with it and you power through, it gets to a stage where it is stressful, but it's also one of the most rewarding jobs you can have. Mm. You leave here, you have spoken to 10 people you wouldn't have speak, spoken to before. You've covered stories you've inter- you're interested in, and everyone else is interested in as well. It's very rewarding. It's very enjoyable by the time you leave here, even if you have to deal with the odd bit of stress. Now, something though, I don't know if you ever have will, but someone in here has actually just had a puppy named after them. Uh, have you ever had a dog named after you? Would you be I jealous? <laughs> Knowing that previous, Cameron now has <laughs> a previous incarnation of the breakfast team had lambs. lambs named after ah. You. Well, you had an animal named after you, have you? I did. I had a a Maltese pup named after me last week. Um, we spoke to her on the show. So outside of my, my role as a broadcast journalist, I am also Peter Dunn from Breakfast with Peter Dunn's sidekick, according to um, our website story yesterday. I don't know who's <laughs> responsible for that, but somebody <laughs> referred to me as a sidekick. Um, and... As a thank you for that and my pleasantries on air with Peter in the mornings, a lovely, a lovely listener by the name of Christina. Christina is from Mukla. She named two of her new male pups after myself and Peter because in her own words, we are her favourite people to listen to. Oh, there you go. And you piss everywhere. <laughs> No comment. Oh, that's what all the papers are for in the newsroom. <laughs> yes, yes. I bet you've never made a cow pregnant. I don't know how to respond to that. I have. I yeah, have. Wanna, Artificial wanna insemination, um, let me stress. Well, I'm just, I'm just going to say something real quick. There, there's something you don't share. That's one of them. Well, we won an award for it, so what, that's why it's worth what sharing. What was the cow called? Was it Daisy? No, Fanny the cow. Oh, Fanny the cow. <laughs> and she was at the National Ploughing Championships with her butt out in the air and there was a very nice man from an artificial insemination company who gave me a big long uh, glove and uh, I'm so glad you said glove (laughs) well he gave me he gave me a long thing to insert as well but the glove had to go in uh, up the the rear and in doing so, and you've got all this warm sensation and the smell and so on, you have to feel around for the, um, the southern section, shall we say, and then the needle goes in to deposit the bull's material. And apparently I'd made a success of this whole operation and Fanny became pregnant. Yes, and there was a little calf born called William. Oh. Also, I do have an animal <laughs> yeah, name. Yeah, yeah. We don't know if they called it William, but we've decided to call I it. have no doubt he grew up to be a virile bull. <laughs> and, th- and this is the thing about radio, you just don't know what's going to happen and the ideas that will work and won't work. And obviously when I came up with that idea and approached him, the look of horror on his face at the time. But to be fair, he's literally anything I've thrown at him over the years 
he's always come through and attempted it, whether it's been successful or not. And the that and was the year and that was the entry for which we won Best Current Fair <laughs> Show in the country, beating RTE, Today FM, yeah. BBC... Yeah. We've mentioned and lived and dined out on that ever since. Yeah. But again, <laughs> because like, you like impregnated that. a cow. <laughs> yes. Yeah. You know, it's probably not what you want to be known for your legacy as <laughs> winning your award for, but it's what people connected with, what people really enjoyed. Uh, the pictures were fantastic. <laughs> I just love how seriously you just told that story to me, Will. You didn't break a smile at all. And the actions as well. Yeah, and how proud you looked at the end. (laughs) Well, there was quite a big crowd around by the end of it as well, um, commenting on how he was doing and how he was getting Yeah, and they were very harsh in their criticism. Were they? Yes. And apparently, like, Fanny's a bit of a slut, so lots of people had a go with the artificial insemination, so it cannot be definitively said that William is mine. I'm talking about the cow as opposed to the boy. He looks like me, I'm fairly sure he's me. Do you wish to change the subject? I will, actually. Um, I'm not sure if you'll like the change of subject, but what was more... You said that people were quite... um, I don't know, they were telling you what to do. What was uh, more embarrassing, that or being naked in front of people with a picture in front of your... Uh... <laughs> I think he quite enjoyed that one. Yeah. Well, well the that... smile on his face yeah. when the picture was taken <laughs> definitely gives a good answer. Well, that was an idea for the Tullamore Lions Club and they wanted to do something uh, charitable to launch the new art centre in Tullamore. And John Lyons, and many people will know John from the office centre very good retailer, very creative guy. He was looking for um, something to do with art and something that could be staged on the street at the time. And um, I'll let you pick up the story from here, Sinead. So Will came up with the idea (laughs) (laughs) and roped poor Brian Cloonan into it, who's a regular guest on Midlands today. And who else? Oh, Anthony Kearns from Guy Clothing. Well, to be fair, Anthony volunteered (laughs) and Brian really didn't know what it was about (laughs) and only discovered when he showed up that he had to strip down to his underwear. Uh, Whereas at least I had time to prepare and to... Have abs drawn on him. Yes. I was about to say hit the gym. (laughs) With with one week's notice, that's not going to do very much. You had something written on your back though as well, didn't you? Arts. With a down arrow towards my arse. (laughs) Yeah. And it was one of our funniest news stories, I think, ever, that three naked men were stopping traffic I in the Midlands town. I had so much joy writing that story. <laughs> really? I did. It was... Was it the pictures? The pictures were definitely a part of it. Um, not because you were in it, Will. Um, Brian, marvellous to look at when you're looking at photos of him. You're not so much, Will. You should probably maybe, maybe avoid the drawn-on abs and maybe... Hit the gym. Yeah. yeah okay. <laughs> A few years ago, I could have pulled it off better. <laughs> I think it was the face paint, though, that added to it as well. It was just, there were so many questions, and then they just had animals painted onto their face as well, just to add to it. I'm not sure why that happened. <laughs> it was organic. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's your favourite word. Yes. Well, I would, I would also like to point out that I, I didn't realise this was going ahead beforehand until Sinead had WhatsApped me a photo of you, Brian and Anthony, naked with no text, no context to to why I was receiving this. And I looked at my phone for about 20 seconds and I said, was that for me? And I had to, I had to ask some of my colleagues, said, Sinead has sent me this photo with no, with no context as to why I got it. And she then, maybe two minutes later, it said, oh, I need you to write a story on this and sent me some detail as to what was actually happening. But for about two minutes, I was very afraid. So before we go, before we end this um, episode up, just want to know, is there any funny stories or anything like that over you? Because I know we've got very different t- lengths of time working on the show, working within news. But has anyone got any funny stories uh, they can tell me? Well, being naked and impregnating cows, that's my <laughs> limit for today. I'll yeah. let the others go here. Um, well, you've thrown me out of a plane. Uh, you sent me off to be an escort at the Culchy Festival, entered me in the Rose of Tralee, uh, put me on the back of a bike and sent me round a motorbike and sent me around the Midlands. Um, what else have you done to me over the years? Several different things. <laughs> Throwing you out of the plane implies that I was physically up there doing it. It's a bit like your nosebleed comment. It's <laughs> and defamatory. 
<laughs> oh, you got dunked, uh, dunked oh, in a... Dunked, yeah. actually, yeah. But that wasn't actually his fault. That was Albert uh, who had set me up for that one. Um, so, yeah, it's been been interesting. Um, I suppose, like, through COVID and, like, the Beast from the East as well, they were interesting times within here because, you know, you were broadcasting from home when the snow hit and we were actually talking to the ESB about power outages in the Midlands and we, he lost power. So it was a case of, like, what do we do? So I ended up... Well, I consider that bringing the information to the listener the moment <laughs> it happens. So there's a power outage in Plum Below. Everybody now knows. So it's just like that. You're in behind the desk one second, you're behind the mic the next. Um, so it's always lots of fun even though it is stressful it's tough but it's the brainstorming it's the ideas it's working together like I love when we're working as a collective in the newsroom trying to come up with a, a really good top line or headline for the website or and the, everybody's working together because I'm a big believer and we all have our own strengths and weaknesses and why we've worked so well together over the years we can be polar opposites at times oh yeah and we can be stuck in our ways and that's why we always need yeah fresh ears and eyes on stories and in fairness to the guys here I hope we haven't scared you too much over the last few months <laughs> we're still here so yeah. I, I think it's a good start <laughs> you've been here how long well how long have you worked here now so I started work experience in May last year and then went on to a graduate programme in September and officially working here since the start of February. Oh, brilliant. And Cameron? My first shift was 2021. 2021 yes. at the end of December, so the, Christ- the Christmas period. Um, my favourite moment, the dog being named after a dog or a dog being named after me, I suppose, is, is fairly high up there. But uh, my favourite moment on air Probably only came a couple of weeks ago, so anyone who listens to Breakfast with Peter Dunn probably know there is a segment that happens every Friday at half past eight called Breaking Cam. Thanks to a rumour you started, actually, Sarah. I did. That, <laughs> that I, I don't laugh, which is out, outrageous, ridiculous. No, I said you were very deadpan and that it's quite hard to make you laugh because you've, you've just got that dem- deadpan kind of personality and sense of humour. Well, as anyone who has listened on the the Friday shows over the last couple of weeks will notice the segment no longer is called Breaking Cam and doesn't feature our intro because Peter well and truly broke me only a couple of weeks ago with um, a joke I'm not going to repeat on air because I'm actually not sure if Will heard it and I don't want him to hear it <laughs> because it will get us in trouble. Um, well, you're Peter, on a podcast now so you can get away with far more. You might as well it. tell us. Myself and Peter, we, we walk the line of uh, what we're allowed and what we're not allowed to say quite frequently. Peter, only three or four weeks ago, went very far over that line and made a joke about about little people and how there there is a growing problem. They have a growing problem. And I laughed so hard that I very visibly cried in the news booth. And then Peter followed that joke up while I was in the middle of crying with a joke about humiditities <laughs> um, about women's breasts when it's particularly warm out. Um, and he broke me. I had to pull down my mic fader and leave the booth and go into the bathroom and almost get sick because I was laughing so hard. <laughs> and it is absolutely my favourite moment on air. Yeah. <laughs> Complaints at Midlands one. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, guys, thank you so, so much for joining me on this episode. Um, it's great to hear a little bit more about the inner workings. Before we go, one last thing. Is there anything else you would want our listeners to know about the newsroom in Midlands today? That my name is Chloe Farrell. <laughs> oh, shit. Did I say your name wrong? At the no. no. Will well, often oh. calls me Chloe Ryan. Oh. So, <laughs> even though it's at the top of the running order every day for him. Once upon a time, there was a Zoe Ryan, and I can't tell you why Zoe Ryan still sticks in my head when I go to say Chloe Farrell, because they're very unrelated. To be so, fair, for the first couple of months, Roy only called me Cleo. So <laughs> There was once a Cleo Knight who <laughs> worked here. I feel so, like I'm having a bit of an identity crisis. I'm not sure what my what name What I is suggest anymore. is treat it like a swear jar. So the next time I do it, I have to put a euro in there. You'll never and get that out of me. Well, it's not that you'll never get it out of me. I just won't spend it. So therefore, you will be <laughs> Chloe Farrell forevermore. I'm happy with that. Good. You made me worry there for a minute. I thought I said it wrong at the beginning. <laughs> but no, thank you very much, guys. 
Muchas gracias. Thank you.